Okay, thank you. Great. Erica, well, you want to start? Yes, welcome everyone. Uh, so nice to see you here from all over the world as the chat seems to be indicating. Um, welcome to Sandra and Jeremy. Uh, this is one of the events the International Humanistic Management Association is very proud to um, engage with our community around. Um, this is the Intellectual Shamans discussion series, um, and it's led by Sandra Waddick, who um, has been doing this now for, for several years. And um, if this is the type of conversation you're interested in, please uh, let me know, uh, let Ariane know, who's also here today, and we can direct you to the website um, for recordings of, of many of the previous conversations we've had. Uh, just briefly, and I, I, I'll turn it right over to Sandra. Um, Sandra's the Galligan Chair of Strategy and Carroll School Scholar of Corporate Responsibility and Professor of Management at Boston College. Um, and we have the opportunity to uh, talk today with Jeremy Lent as well. Um, the Humanistic Management Association is all about dignity and well-being, so this certainly uh, falls within that vein as well. Um, and I think I'll just turn it right over to Sandra. Sandra, thank you so much. Jeremy, welcome. And again, welcome to all. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks, Erica and Ariane. Um, Ariane is going by Michael Pearson's name. Uh, so, so she's actually in the background there. Um, so several years ago, I picked up this book called The Patterning Instinct, and I was absolutely blown away by it. And um, since then, Jeremy Lent has, uh, and if you have not read that book, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, it is truly mind blowing. And um, uh, since then, Jeremy has produced another book called The Web of Meaning, um, which is equally excellent. And now he's writing on ecological civilization, or will be, and he's going to share some of his early thoughts on that. He's been described by The Guardian uh, journalist, George Monbiot, as one of the greatest thinkers of our age, and I absolutely have to agree with, with that designation. Um, he, he does work that investigates how and why our civilizations look the way they do. Why are we facing these ex existential crises that we're facing? And um, he traces the historical underpinnings and flaws of our dominant worldview back to uh, a long time ago. So, um, and really looks at the patterns that have emerged over time and how we can begin to shift the way we are and the way we're thinking. So I think you will enjoy, I've seen a version of the presentation that Jeremy's gonna make. We'll do, we'll do our usual, um, Thing where we where we ask people to put their questions for Jeremy in chat. Jeremy will speak for about maybe half an hour or so, and then I'll ask him a qu couple of questions depending on the timing, and then we'll turn it over to you so that you can directly ask your questions. We'll ask you to unmute and um, to to ask your questions directly. But uh, Erica and uh, Ariane and I will be scanning the chat for your questions so that we have a sense of what they are. So Jeremy, I turn it over to you. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Sandra. Um, and yeah, like, so I, I will be talking today about, um, not so much about the past, but there will be some look at um, some of our historical underpinnings, but a lot looking to what's possible into the future. Uh, and um, to start with, I'm going to, as, you, as uh, Sandra said, take you through a presentation uh, part of this. So I'm going to share my screen right now. And hopefully what you can see there is um, the uh, picture, <coughs> Sandra's picture from her book, um, uh, Envisioning an Ecological Civilization. And <coughs> what I like to do to begin with this kind of look at this kind of core question of well why do we need a different kind of of a uh, civilization in the first place and i think the best place to begin to answer that question is to basically just look at <clears throat> for a moment like to contemplate um our only home the earth like this the big picture if you will here is this lovely beautiful dot in this <clears throat> vast eternal um space and right now is the only place we know of in the universe where life exists. Um, and in this beautiful planet, life actually emerged quite early on in the planet's history, <laughs> um, billions of years ago. 
Um, and over those billions of years, it developed all this complexity. But just in the last couple of hundred thousand years ago, did one particular species develop, which cum um, collectively, <clears throat> through collective intelligence, began to develop the capability to alter the very nature of life itself on this incredible planet. And of course, that species is um, the Homo sapiens, is um, our own species. And if we ask ourselves, how are we doing in terms of this awesome um, technical power we, um, did, we began to accumulate? Well, as all of us in this group know, the only real answer we can answer is we're doing terribly. And um, right now, we're looking around and we're just seeing these harbingers of a really daunting, even terrifying future of wildfires and floods and drought. And of course, we know at this point, all of these things that we're experiencing in more, more extremely from year to year are because of the climate emergency that we're facing. Um, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with a chart like this that <clears throat> looks at the, if our current emissions keep going at, as they are right now, we're heading <clears throat> by the end of the century for what scientists call a catastrophic um, three degrees or plus um, rise in historical temperatures. Um, and even if we were to actually ag aggressively meet these targets the countries are um, uh, sort of talking about, we're still really on track for more like a two degrees, uh, like which again, scientists talk about as a prescription for disaster, because a lot of this has to do with these zones we're entering of these cascading amplifying feedback effects. Um, and we're beginning to just leave behind the very notion of that one and a half, which in itself isn't a safe target. But here's the thing about the climate emergency. Drastic as it is, it's really um, just a symptom of an even deeper underlying problem. And that problem is the vast ecological destruction that our civilization is causing around the earth in every different aspect. And just to give you a few highlights of what I mean by that, and there's been a 69% decline in animal populations worldwide since this 1970 alone. And because of this and other factors, we're now entering into what scientists are calling the sixth great extinction of species since life began on Earth. The first five, of course, were caused by <clears throat> major um, natural events. This one is caused by one particular species, our own. We're looking at the annihilation of coral reefs worldwide this century. Um, just a terrifying prospect. And, and the UN reports that 95% of Earth's land will be degraded by the middle of this century. But of all these statistics, the one that kind of blows my mind the most is this one, that at current rates, by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish. And so obviously, it's very reasonable to ask, how did we get to this crazy place of destroying the quality of life on this earth? And in that book that Sandra mentioned, um, that I wrote a few years back called The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning, I looked at the ways in which shifting cultures brought us to this place. But one, there was one sort of lesson, if you will, that distilled itself from that book, in my view, which is simply this, that culture shapes values. Those values shape history. And by the same token, <clears throat> the values that we hold today, our dominant values, will shape the future. So let's take a look at what are our dominant values in, <clears throat> in the, the dominant culture today. Well, basically, those values are based on separation. I like to use this picture. It's kind of indicative of this kind of separation we exist in right now where all these people separate from each other, connected to their technology and almost totally separate from the food they're about to eat, not even thinking about where it might have come from. And if we kind of dig one level deeper in this <clears throat> kind of worldview of separation, we see there's, there's like a story attached to it. The story goes something like this, that nature is a machine, that humans are separate from nature, that humans are separate from each other. And the human progress basically arises from the conquest of nature, that the earth is really just a resource to exploit for human benefit. And as a result of all these things, basically the purpose of life itself is really just to get wealthy and powerful as much as you can. And now, <clears throat> this might seem like this worldview has always been around, but it's actually a unique worldview in human history that just 
emerged in early modern Europe a few hundred years ago, around the time of the scientific revolution. And it emerged in this kind of um, mindset really best expressed by Francis Bacon, the sort of prophet of the scientific age, when he talked about this ability of, of this new worldview to establish and extend the power of dominion of the human race itself over the universe. And with this power of science, he said, we could render ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. And the Europeans at the time took this idea and they saw themselves not just as conquering nature with that new power that they developed, but conquering other continents too. And of course, they did that um, with colonialism in the centuries that followed. Um, and so that worldview of separation that formed in Europe through this conquest of colonialism basically became <clears throat> embedded in part of the, the dominant worldview of all the worlds, <clears throat> basically all the world around. A worldview that sees others, that sees basically nature as a resource and other people as also resources, leading to um, these notions of human supremacy versus all other non-human um, beings. And because this came from um, these white European Christians, um, mostly males from that worldview, um, you, this is the source of white supremacy, this kind of belief of some innate, <clears throat> uh, it, it, like innate superiority of the white race that developed with racist colonialism. That led to this processes of extraction and exploitation that ultimately led to the system that we've inherited today, the system of global capitalism. And we are really under the dominance of global capitalism today, so much so that if we look at the 100 largest economies in the world today, 69 of those 100 are not even countries, but actually the transnational corporations. And these transnational corporations, of course, are driven by the requirement to keep growing their shareholder <coughs> returns as fast as possible. Um, and so um, they uh, collectively, these corporations and the system that, uh, that dominates our world is this growth-based capitalism based on perpetual growth. Like everyone's familiar, of course, with this kind of chart, like the price to earnings ratio, which really captures this notion that when um, investors value the companies, they're not even valuing them on what they're doing today, but on the expectation of how fast they're going to grow those earnings into the future which is a system well designed to mint billionaires, as we've gotten so accustomed to, um, <clears throat> as we just um, look at the news every day, um, and one that has led to the greatest inequality in history, where roughly the wealthiest uh, couple of dozen billionaires right now own as much wealth as half of the entire world's population of 4 billion people. And when we look at this system of global capitalism, we have to recognize that it's not just incredibly unfair, but also inherently unsustainable with these core design principles of the system of maximizing shareholder returns, keep growing at all costs, seeing basically material consumption as some proxy of human welfare and seeing non-human nature as this resource to exploit. Um, and that leads to these <coughs> directives from this system for those corporations and for people who will become sucked into that system to monetize everything as fast as possible, to turn other humans into basically conditioned consumers and to exploit every available resource on the earth. And in terms of that exploiting as fast as possible, this system has done an incredibly good job. Um, <clears throat> so much so if we look back from really the end of the Second World War uh, to the present day, what we see is what um, earth scientists have called the great acceleration in virtually every aspect of human activity, production, consumption, um, and use of, re of earth resources. We see this explosion of activity since that period of time. And as we look forward um, into the next few decades, we're seeing a continued increase with all the destruction that's caused so far. Um, uh, mainstream economists are actually <clears throat> forecasting a tripling of that level of consumption um, and production um, just by the middle of this century. And of course, <clears throat> some sort of techno-optimists talk about this idea of, oh, well, what, what we need is not to stop growing, but we need green growth strategy. But unfortunately, that's 
green growth strategy is basically a myth that has been debunked by hard statistics, um, as in, as for example, in this um, uh, paper that went out, decoupling debunked. And if you, all you need to do is look at these lines in this graph of looking at the rise in GDP and the consumption of raw material globally, and you see <clears throat> that um, these two things are intimately tied together. And as a result of all this, now Earth scientists <clears throat> looking at uh, basically what what can we uh, like? What are our planetary boundaries? What are the limits to what we can do? And um, Johan Rockström and a group of scientists at the Stockholm Resilience Institute have developed this model of what they call a safe operating space for humanity. So that safe operating space is the small circle in the green. And out of the um, nine planetary boundaries that they've identified, we've already blown through um, at least five of them. <clears throat> which is why scientists are giving these warnings to humanity. <clears throat> Thousands of them uh, wrote a paper just a few years back saying, soon it'll be too late to shift course away from our failing trajectory. Uh, at the Potsdam Institute, Hans Schellenhuber writes about a very big risk that we will end our civilization. And <clears throat> UN Secretary General just the other day talked about this current path as being collective suicide if we don't change it. So we have to ask ourselves, where are we headed for? And if we look back in history, we see there's only been a couple of true transformative shifts in the human experience from all the way from when we are first nomadic hunter-gatherers. One was about 10,000 years ago when we um, learned, we developed agriculture. The other was with our scientific revolution just a few hundred years ago. Oh, pretty much every observer who looks at this situation is convinced that this century we're undergoing another of <clears throat> the great transitions in human history. The question is, what's it going to be? Is it going to be a transition towards collapse, just like we've been looking at based on, um, on what the scientists are projecting? Um, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I believe a lot of uh, sort of techno optimists, people in the global elite, <clears throat> actually sort of do see a change, but they see it more um, like maybe they can sort of let the rest of the world collapse and sort of split off developing their technological enhancements and their <clears throat> um, internet-based neural enhancements and sort of become basically a new version of humanity and let the rest of everybody else collapse, which in a way, <clears throat> from a moral standpoint, may be even more egregious than a total collapse of, <clears throat> of, of all of our civilization. But then, and there's a question, is it possible to somehow sort of thread the needle to find a different kind of path of another kind of transformation, but the one that could lead to sustainable flourishing? And that's what um, we're going to be focusing our attention on right now for the rest of this talk. And um, can we move towards something that increasingly is being called an ecological civilization um, as that transformation? So. Well, what is an ecological civilization? Basically, it's looking at the notion of the transformation in the basis of our global civilization from one that is wealth-based to one that is life-based. And an ecological civilization is looking at basically creating a global cultural and economic system that actually promotes sustainable flourishing for humans and earth. So basically, the overriding objective of this kind of civilization would be simply to create the conditions for all humans to flourish as part of a thriving living earth. And the important thing to understand about an ecological civilization is it's not the idea of just a few, <clears throat> um, a small group of people putting their heads together and saying, oh, this is what we need to do. It's basically an emerging vision coming from diverse sources all around the world, indigenous sources, <clears throat> like concepts like Buen Vivir and Sumac Corsé and permaculture principles and community-based sources like um, transition towns and theories of the commons and agroecology, spiritual sources like deep ecology or engaged Buddhism, um, and then political sources um, like the racial justice movement, anti-globalization movement. All these <clears throat> different groups together even though they, they might seem very separate in some ways, are all moving towards this vision of what's possible for a life-affirming civilization. So let's look at that term ecological civilization. Basically, the notion is um, that it can be based 
on ecologies themselves, like how living systems self-organize. And to understand more about that, we can look at some of the deeper principles, the core principles of what an ecological civilization would be. So I'm going to do that next. And it's kind of helpful to look at these principles in terms of three levels, if you will. One is like just to get a, a sense of some of the fundamental principles of life itself on this earth. Then to look at some general principles of ecosystems. And then what are specific principles of human flourishing, unique to our own species? So beginning with the fundamental principles of life, um, obviously, uh, we can just have time to look at a couple of some of these notions, but one core principle of the way all aspects of life work from a single cell to organisms to full ecosystems is this, and, and basically this is true of all complex systems of which life is that, um, is this notion of reciprocal causality where each part of the system affects the whole, while the system as a whole affects each part. And in living complex systems, we see another core principle that we can call integration, which is a sense of unity within the system, but with differentiation, where each part is maintaining its unique identity while coordinating with the other parts. And these parts, in order to remain integrated, have to remain in intimate feedback loops of communication with a large number of related parts. And something that emerges from these complex systems of life, again, from the tiniest cell <clears throat> to ecosystems, is um, this notion of what's known as small world networks with hubs and spokes. The way these communications happen, um, it, whether it's in intracellular networks, neural networks, fungal networks, and <clears throat> ecosystem, is like lots of small communications in, in clustered in one group and a few um, uh, more tenuous communications with other parts of the overall system. And when these, um, when you build up from the tiniest parts to the largest parts, what scientists recognize is that each system is fractally connected within larger systems. Fractals basically are patterns that repeat themselves at different scales, and they indicate self-organized activity, and they're everywhere in the natural world, as we see from these like leaves, neurons, trees, and lungs, shells, you name it. And, and earth scientists now look and they understand nature itself as being one kind of gigantic fractally connected system where each cell is basically um, part of an organism, which is fractally part of a species, um, which is a fractal part of an ecosystem, ultimately part of the living earth. And some people refer to these concepts of systems within systems all the way to uh, basically the, the system of Gaia, basically as the holarchy. And another core principle of life is as it evolved its complexity over these billions of years, it only did so in a few big phase transitions from single cells to complex, to multicellular life, to social animals, and finally hominids. Every one of those steps arose from an increase in cooperation, not from competition, but cooperation. And when we want to look <coughs> at um, how these ecosystems developed, what we re um, can recognize is the ecosystems arising from these core principles can remain resilient for millions of years. So now we're going to look <clears throat> at some of those principles of ecosystems and cells, and we'll kind of begin to see how that can apply if we take these core principles to a human system. Well, first of all, what we find <clears throat> is that cooperation that evolved over and millions and millions of years. And the most important aspect of that is known as mutually beneficial symbiosis. So if you walk in the forest, um, what's going on all around you is all these different um, elements of the ecosystem working in symbiosis together from plants to the insects pollinating the plants, animals transporting their seeds and fertilizing the soil, fungus regenerating the soil and, and using mycorrhizal networks to transport the nutrients of the trees themselves. And we see this a core principle of holarchy, um, basically where each is part of the greater whole. And a principle for human flourishing arising out of that is that the sustainable health of the whole system requires the flourishing of each part. It's a core concept we can think of as fractal flourishing. 
then there's diversity that um, <clears throat> like a system's health depends on differentiation and integration. And if we look at how that might apply to human society, <clears throat> we can interpret that as seeing like the inherent rights of each person and community to participate in cultural, political, and economic power. Then there's a sense of balance that ecosystems have, that every part is in a dynamically stable relationship with the entire system. That could translate into a human ecological civilization as a steady state economy with equitable distribution of wealth and power. And if we look at an ecosystem, of course, <clears throat> there's um, quite literally grassroots self-autonomy that while every, every organism is part of the greater whole, each one makes its decisions literally at the grassroots. Um, <clears throat> and in human society, that translates into this notion of subsidiarity, pushing decision-making down to the lowest level possible in the system. And then there's like embeddedness, that each component is basically always acting as part of the, of the larger system. And in human terms, that really is recognizing human embeddedness with the living earth and tending our mother earth rather than trying to control or conquer her. And then in an ecosystem, every part regenerates the entire system, leading to sustainable flourishing into the long term. And really the Iroquois Confederacy are probably ones who best um, encompass this idea in this core principle that they have, or that seven generations principle in their constitution. In every deliberation, they say, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. So if those are how ecosystems themselves work, well, there are certain aspects to the human species that are worth focusing on for a minute. And then we'll turn into more specific details of what an ecological civilization might actually look like. <clears throat> but first, um, let's look at what are specific principles of human flourishing. And the fundamental thing to understand, we looked at how um, as, life's ever, um, as life evolved over billions of years, and it grew in complexity through increases in cooperation. And with the evolution of hominids in just the last few million years, um, there was actually an even greater increase in cooperation um, than we see in almost any other um, species, in the sense that humans evolved to be cooperative. Um, and early humans, when they found themselves away um, uh, in the more dangerous savanna millions of years ago, our pre-hominid ancestors, were vulnerable to predators. Those who learned to collaborate and turned out to be the ones that were most successful. And over millions of years, as we evolved our unique um, <coughs> Homo sapiens species, our identity expanded from self and kin to include the entire group. So our human ability to cooperate with each other, even those who are not kin, is actually what differentiates us from other primates. And um, as a result of that, on those millions of years, we as humans evolved what are known as moral emotions. We feel things like compassion, guilt, gratitude, shame, or embarrassment. <clears throat> These are things we feel as a result of our group identity. And we don't just act morally because we think we should. We do it because it actually feels right to us in our being. <clears throat> and indigenous cultures around the world um, process that. They, they, <clears throat> they built their cultures around those concepts. So in Africa, you have this core foundational concept of Ubuntu, which roughly translates as I am, because you are. Here in North America, the uh, Lakota tribe, for example, has this concept of mitsakuye oyesin, which translates as like, we are all related. And that set of relations doesn't just refer to their own, um, <clears throat> their own direct family, but basically all the species around them, which leads to like a life-based value system from this understanding, which was best expressed by Albert Schweitzer when he had <clears throat> this great uh, statement, I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. And as a result, in his words, I cannot but have reverence for all that is called life. That is the beginning and foundation of morality. <clears throat> so if we summarize where that takes us, um, when what we're really looking at in an ecological civilization is a transformation in values, an emphasis on the quality of life rather than material possessions. 
and basing our political, social, economic choices on that sense of our shared humanity, emphasizing justice and dignity for all, and building civilization's future on the basis of symbiosis with the living earth, where basically the flourishing of the natural world is a foundational principle. So what might that actually look like in practice? And I, I can give you just a glimpse of how that would translate to specifics, like sort of policy kind of issues. And what we're talking about, again, is not just one element, like economy or something like that, but it shifts around the entire aspect of civilization, from technology to wealth distribution, governance, culture, and community. So just to touch on some glimpses of that. Well, first, we'd be looking at a drastic reduction in global income inequality. Um, basically, a just transition from this fossil fuel economy that's destroying us. And things like a global wealth tax, property being returned to the commons, uh, rather than um, all held in these uh, um, extreme inequalities. And basically, some form of universal basic income um, applicable to all people on the earth. And we'd be looking at replacing uh, gross domestic product as a measure of national welfare, which really just measures essentially how fast we're consuming uh, the earth and turning human beings into the monetary economy. And there are many <clears throat> indicators like that that have been developed. One is the, say, the genuine progress indicator, which factors in <clears throat> things like negatives, such as income inequality, pollution and crime, and positives like volunteer work, household work, or education. We'd be looking at shifting the model of our economics to something very like um, Kate Rayworth donut economics, recognizing that what the, the job of economics is to find a way to fit within that ecological ceiling um, to stop the overshoot that we were looking at before, those planetary boundaries, along with a, found, a social foundation, all those elements like water, energy, food, uh, peace, social equity, that are foundational for a, a safe and just space for humanity to exist in. A key issue would be to uh, transform corporations so that they actually existed for humanity rather than for shareholder returns. Now, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the notion of benefit corporations or B Corps, um, where a corporation changes its charter so that it's um, legally obliged to consider the impact of its decisions on multiple constituencies. Um, but, and it's been somewhat successful for these companies that have taken it, but it's had virtually no impact on the system as a whole because it's voluntary. So few companies choose it. But in an ecological civilization, there'd be a triple bottom line of not just profit, but people and planet required for corporate charters for transnational corporations. And maybe their charters could only be renewed, say, every five years at the discretion of community-based panels chosen by sortition rather than by sort of professional regulators in a revolving door or whatever. So corporations would have to fundamentally alter their entire process. They'd be subject not just to financial bankruptcy, but social or environmental bankruptcy. And um, we'd be looking at transforming our economy uh, of production to a circular economy, which increases employment while re reducing waste with products designed for repair and recycling, sourcing from recycled materials, and virtually eliminating waste. <clears throat> In cities, <clears throat> we'd look at city redesign with um, community gardens on every block, um, extensive use of energy efficient designs, cars banned from city centers, and basically essential services always within a 20 minute walk. So a complete <clears throat> a redesign of our cities. Out of the cities, <clears throat> um, we'd be looking at agroecology, replacing the monocrops we see right now based on permaculture and regenerative agriculture principles with greater crop biodiversity, water carbon efficiency, virtual elimination of synthetic fertilizer and the elimination of factory farming. In technology, we'd be looking at shifting from this <clears throat> and centralized control that we see in the platform economy right now in these uh, companies like Google, Amazon, or Facebook um, to a decentralized <clears throat> distributed ledger type of technology, um, so, which empowers people to coordinate and cooperated scale, which is being developed in many different ways using blockchain and distributed autonomous organizations or DAOs. When we look at culture more generally, we'd be looking at like what um, Rian Eisler 
uh, refers to is shifting from the domination system, basically of the patriarchy based on hierarchies and violence, which has been characteristic of many ag agrarian civilizations for thousands of years and is very characteristic of our civilization today towards a partnership system, focusing on equitable <clears throat> structures and equal valuing of males and females, um, and basically a, a s beliefs and stories that give value to empathic and caring relations. More globally in governance, we'd be looking at a UN rights of nature, putting natural world on the same legal standing as humanity, personhood given to ecosystems, rivers, high functioning mammals, and ecocide being defined as a crime, as an international crime. And we'd be looking at setting aside <clears throat> like half of the planet for non-human nature um, under indigenous stewardship. So right now we know that there's a 30 by 30% uh, by 2030 being uh, talked about in the Biodiversity Summit right now in Montreal. Well, we have to increase that significantly to maybe half. Um, and from a global perspective, we'd be looking at building a planetary consciousness. Remember that hub and spoke <clears throat> image of how um, complex systems work? Well, we'd be looking at something similar <clears throat> in how we organize as human beings, where we've got, we'd have a, um, a more localization with a place-based identity, with a local community focus, face-to-face -face interactions, um, with networks building trust and agency within our communities. And at the same time, we'd be having those kind of um, spokes leading to a planetary consciousness with maybe something like Facebook being converted to the commons, enabled as a platform to build our sense of shared human humanity, cosmopolitanism leading to a sense of global citizenship, where we can celebrate our diversity while recognizing our deep interdependence. And ultimately, from the big picture, what we'll basically be looking at is moving from the Anthropocene, which is where we are right now, where this ideology of human supremacy, destructors of life and biodiversity, basically inherently unsustainable, to what um, Glenn Albrecht has called the symbiocene, basically, uh, a period of life of, which might be far longer than either the Holocene or the Anthropocene, based on principle of symbiosis, of mutual beneficial flourishing of humans and the living earth, um, you, where we'd actually be learning to use our technology for regenerative, for life-affirming practices. Ultimately, we have the potential to become a civilization learning how to tend Mother Earth. So that closes this kind of formal part of this presentation. These are the two books um, that Sandra referred to earlier. And I invite you all, by the way, to join a group of more than 2,000 people around the world right now who are part of this global community of the Deep Transformation Network, who are sharing conversations together about how to move towards this ecological civilization. So thanks for that. I'm going to stop the sharing right now. It's a lot of material <laughs> I kind of had to race through uh, to <clears throat> give time for us to have conversation too. So let me uh, turn it to you, Sandra, um, and anybody else who wants to take part in the conversation now. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was super. Um, and I know you've raised a bunch of questions. And given the time, I'm going to turn directly to some of the questions. So Gerard Farias. Would you like to ask your, you were, yeah. you're asking the question I was going to ask anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, th thank you for, thanks, Sandra. And thank you for that, Jeremy. It was, it was really great. Uh, my question, I, I tend to ask this question at almost every webinar <laughs> I attend. Uh, given where we are right now, given the latest COP27, et cetera, uh, everything seems to be lagging behind tremendously, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and the scale and scope of what we need to do and the urgency with which it needs to be done. Uh, how, how do we get there? Yeah. Unless, uh, so, so I'm talking about it more in a practical, transitional kind of way. And uh, every, I mean, I, I put in my question, the US just announced mm -hmm. the latest stealth bomber. Yeah. So in that context, how do we get there? 
Yeah, I agree. I think this is, I'm so glad you asked that question to begin with. This is the most fundamentally important question. And I think what we need to realize, I mean, certainly, um, you know, so, some people look at this kind of message I give and they say, oh, he's a real optimist or whatever. Um, no, I'm actually, I'm not an optimist in that sense. I mean, I see just as clearly as, as all of us here, the the path that we are heading faster and faster towards that destruction. And it seems like there's this monolithic juggernauts that we can do or seeming like need nothing about to change the direction. I, I see all that. And it's very possible we are going in that place. But here's the thing. One of the things we learn when we look at complex systems, uh, any kind of complex system, including human complex systems like our civilizations or society, is they are non-linear, which means they're also very, they're inherently unpredictable. You never know how they are going to unfold. And one thing we do know about complex systems, and we can expect from in this civilization too, is they go through phase transitions. And as a civilization like ours or any system starts to go through that phase transition, it begins to unravel. We right now are experiencing the very frightening, the terrifying and painful effect of the unraveling with the, not just the climate disasters, but the political shift towards extremism and um, the climate refugees um, like suffering so much and all these unba unbalances. But along with the devastation that we will begin to see increasingly comes also a glimmer of what's possible because it like imagine something like say like a rug that you're trying to change the design of you can't do anything with that rug when it's tightly stitched but if that rug begins to unravel it opens up the possibilities to reweave it the ultimate uh the real kind of trick of it and the hardest thing to do is can we reweave our society while it is ongoing, undergoing this collapse that our dominant society is before everything completely collapses? That's our challenge. And there's this beautiful quote by the systems <coughs> um, theorist, Ilya Prigogini, where he talks about the notion of islands of coherence within a sea of chaos. And I think that's what we have to be focusing on is both um, like each of us working on these different elements of creating our islands of coherence, basically creating the ecological civilization from within in whatever we're working on. And at the same time, remember that um, principle of reciprocal causality I talked about, the parts affect the whole while the whole affect the parts. Well, we're building our separate islands of coherence, just as important is to connect with those other islands of coherence that we see around and build a more coherent sense of what we're all moving towards. That's, I feel, the, the chance that we have that in the next 10, 20 years or more, whatever, I think we're going to see things unravel more and more terrifyingly. And it's what it's when enough of us focus on what is actually possible, and rather than just resisting and fighting against the um, the the collapsing system, work on creating the new system from within. It gives that possibility that we might just kind of thread that needle into um, what's needed. Thank you, Jeremy. What a Thank you. great response. Um, I can't. I'm just sitting here. And both times I've heard this this general talk, um, I'm just amazed at how consonant our system, our our approach to this is. Yeah. Um, and I just want to point out that you know when I, I define the intellectual shaman, which this series sort of revolves around, which of course you are one of, um, as a healer, a connector, and a sense maker. And it's that connecting process, that um, connecting, coherent, and amplifying that uh, these entities that are now emerging that I'm calling transformation catalysts right. um, are, are, um, are, are trying to build as a process for actually moving us towards purposeful yes. system transformation more quickly. Um, so Bruce Kibler, you have multiple comments. Could you pick maybe the one, that top one and, um, and ask that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can continue flashing at us here. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I, I got it. Now I have, you make me want to I have to scroll back then. Uh, um, uh, oh, I guess uh, the the um, excellent studies on complex systems. <clears throat> uh, I mean, you know, you you speak to it, and and there are some excellent. I mean, complex systems are really fascinating, uh, and there's some really great studies out there. Um, and and of course, we we're, we're part of that, and we create them as well. 
Um, and you also mentioned the emergent properties, but there's there's also some interesting uh, studies, you know, on emergent properties of of human civilization. Uh, and and we seem to um, there are patterns, there are patterns, and they seem to be somewhat innate, and they they tend to revolve revolve around the um, you know uh, accession of power uh, mm -hmm. in some way. Um, yes. So I guess my biggest question is how. How do we how do we subvert? How do we change? How do we uh, you know go into this this you know complex system which is being generated by an emergent property that is some part of it, us that we don't even understand and begin changing? Yes, yeah, and such an important question, <clears throat> um, really great one to raise. Thank you. And um, I think what we need to understand, and when we're thinking about power is to recognize that there's this really interesting dynamic in the way humans relate to each other. If we look historically um, at um, how we organized as human beings when we were nomadic hunter-gatherers, basically how we evolved and some of those notions I talked about, like these moral emotions, et cetera, um, what we see is that uh, the, the power was with the community. Uh, we involve sort of commons-based principles, if you will, of nomadic hunter-gatherer bands working together basically without hierarchies. And when some hunter would get like too big for his britches or whatever and start to become more like that sort of male dominant, um, like we see in other primate species, uh, then the, there would be sophisticated um, basically social technologies that um, nomadic hunter-gatherers would use, like ridicule or basically um, organizing together to stop somebody from getting ahead, uh, from getting too much power. That changed basically with the rise of sedentism and agriculture. And then we see this ratcheting effect of wealth actually then enabling more wealth. And then the rise of the patriarchy and the rise of these dominant hierarchical structures that we now see in such an extreme way um, in our world today. So what I think we need to do is learn basically from our nomadic hunter-gatherer ancestors. And the most important way we can learn that is by applying these kind of notions of the principles of the commons. And I'm sure many of you are familiar <coughs> with um, the work of, uh, of Eleanor Ostrom, Nobel Prize winner, who identified basically how successful commons actually work and, and continue to work sometimes for hundreds of years um, in self-organized communities. And people like David Bollier, who's book Free, Fair, and Alive, I strongly recommend, writes about how these principles of the commons can apply right now in modern technology, in modern society, within cities. And that's how I think we can subvert the power. And um, basically is not, when we've got ideas, if, if someone's got some great idea to build um, a new company to do something that could really make a, a positive di difference, to look at organizing right from the outset based on cooperative or commons-based principles. And when we're looking at global power and things like our corrupt political system and the power of, of these hierarchical corporations, this is where we need to focus on building that sense of shared humanity. So we have to keep, keep building those bridges and um, basically against some of the directives of what our um, social media does, which is kind of break down that sense of shared humanity, create silos. We have to keep building those bridges with other groups of people all around the world working on things like core justice, core sense of equity, because there is one powerful secret weapon that we all have within us, that those corporations with and those um, militaries with all their missiles and everything, what they don't have, which is that every one of us, 8 billion human beings has a core sense in our hearts of justice, of fairness. And the dominant society has to condition people from infancy onwards to kind of push those down or try to eliminate those, but we all have that within them. So in all of our work, what we can and must do is appeal to that sense of fairness, that sense of human compassion and connection Connectedness in others around us. That's our core weapon uh, to fight back on that. That's our core power. And that's what we ultimately um, will have to rely on to subvert what we're seeing um, in the world today. Yeah, of course, um, indigenous people have always felt this sense mm -hmm. of all my relations, as you as you noted earlier. And, uh, and 
build in the reciprocity of synergy and collaboration, cooperation, and and yet we've allowed this what what Eisler calls these uh, dominant dominator right. societies to evolve. Andrea um, Gowessler, you had several comments. Could you pick out the or, or questions? Could you pick out the one you think is most important? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yes, for me, it's the one about how can new approaches gain traction. So. Just just very briefly, there is a, a social innovator called Jim Ruff, and he created something called the Wisdom Council Process. Um, and it's a fantastic way of facilitating unity and to mm -hmm. engage head, heart and gut and to really uh, listen to people and, and create a new level of, of thinking in the group that sort of harnesses the wisdom. But people are really scared of trying new things out because you cannot guarantee the outcomes because it's actually to the group. You don't mm. put them in the same boundaries that you did before. And somehow it's a fantastic process and yet we can't gain traction because people are scared. Yes, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And, um, and that has a lot to do really with some of the things we were just talking about in terms of a sort of power structures and actually um, trusting in the community. And so it's so much of it has to do with like our dominant culture basically tells us not to trust community, you know, to build power for ourselves individually. And if you've got an idea to kind of own it, to um, try to um, not, <coughs> not give up that power, but to build power for yourself. And so a lot of it has to do, I think it begins basically with um, building core community with trust um, so that we can actually, and that only happens over time and, and with shared intention. Where, so we can begin to learn to trust that if something doesn't work quite right, um, that in fact, um, it's okay. We're not going to get like shut down and also trusting in the wisdom of our collective agency. So um, a, a lot of it is when we develop um, other organization models like um, heterarchy or um, sociocracy or holacracy or whatever, a lot of that has to do with actually recognizing the groups of people together when organized, when the conditions are established in the right way, can actually come up with much better decisions than any of us can come up with alone. So that does take, um, I think ultimately it's a shift in identity. It takes uh, realizing that each of us, and you know, I, I'll, I'll admit that um, speaks for um, me too in many of, of my own processes over the years, is to recognize we, we've been indoctrinated by this dominant society. And we need to see those um, false stories we tell ourselves and begin to realize that there is a different set of stories that actually are um, scientifically valid and um, evolutionarily valid um, and valid in terms of, of how systems work to begin to give ourselves, it's almost like expanding our identity to be part of the group so we can actually begin to trust the group. And um, what we see, as I'm sure, many of you have experienced yourself is when that happens, when our, our identity begins to expand to the group itself, it actually kind of takes a weight off ourselves. We begin to kind of feel a sense of liberation almost, like being part of something bigger. And it can be a beautiful kind of spiritual opening, but also allows for that moving towards the kind of collaborative intelligence that we need. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Ian, Ian McFarlane, you had a number of comments as well. Would you like to pick the one you like want to ask the most? Oh, geez. Uh, I think you've <laughs> answered most of them. Uh, the great, your, I thought about the great unraveling is, I think, really on point in the sense that my interpretation is that uh, we've got to get to a point where people fear the dystopian more than they uh, more than a few of us, it seems, that quest for the utopian. Um, my one one point, I didn't point it in here. I don't know if you've read up on this, but but uh, uh, in the spatial theory geography area, there's a fellow who just wrote a paper, Mark Purcell, out of University of Washington in planning, where he's talking about Henry uh, Lefebvre's uh, production of space and creating differential space within the abstract capitalist space as points of um, utopian hope, uh, mm -hmm. if you will, creating spaces where people are pushing back against the abstract capitalism. And by doing so, they're practicing 
these collaborative and yes. collective behaviors. And the more we practice them, you know, even if society isn't over the hurdle yet of collective action, the, the more society will be ready to, to adopt them. So yeah. I thought that was a really interesting approach. And that's, that's the way I'm approaching it with my company. So yeah, I love to, to, to hear that. And thank you for what you're doing. And I couldn't agree more. I think that that's, yeah, it comes back again to that notion of building these islands of coherence and something that I've been discovering as I'm doing the research for this book on ecological civilization. And it's been really inspirational for me is just to realize how much when we start to look at what's going on all around the world, this is actually happening. It's happening yeah. in places in like Rojava in uh, Kurds, uh, uh, Kurdish territory in Syria. It's happening in places like Kerala, like incredible things being done in that in, in, in that area. It's happening uh, in in like uh, like the peasant movement, like Via Campesina, like this massive movement of tens of millions of um, agroecology oriented people working around the world together to fight back against this globalized destruction that's taking place. And it happens in our cities. It happens in common spaced um, entities. If we even look at high tech, and um, there's amazing groups of people working on Web3 design, totally aware of the destructive nature of global capitalism and looking and realizing that how this next generation of technology could really become massively important and actually working on things like explicitly taking Eleanor Ostrom's design principles into the actual program in itself of organizing how people can trans it can basically act in whole different areas from economics to governance to whatever, using these kind of principles. So um, I think that's what's exciting. And what we really need to do is each of us look at what is driving our own sense of inspiration and make sure that the principles that we're applying, all those principles truly towards a more collaborative future, and then keep connecting with what others are doing elsewhere to keep building that shared global sense of coherence. Great, thank you. Thank you. There's so many questions that uh, I'd like to get to or, or comments. Um, um, I'm, I'm not too sure who to pick. Ian, Ian Kendrick, do you wanna have a question or make a comment? Uh, thanks, Sandra. Uh, great, 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 great session, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments from me. I'm very, very conscious of uh, the work of Maturana and Varela with a notion of autopoiesis and pathological autopoiesis. And boy, is our species pathologically autopoietic. We're killing our environment. It'll kill us. Two other comments, because I've got to go to yet another Zoom meeting. One is the urgent need for us to be able to reperceive what's in front of us rather than it happening as a dreadful shock when the reperception of reality isn't what we think it is and it's about to kill us. We need to be able to reperceive as an act, a uh, conscious act all the time. And also I see Charles Savage has brought up the notion of the, the Kairos moment uh, from the Greek, uh, the two different ways of time, chronos chronologically and Kairos when things are happening at the same time. And when a Kairos moment emerges, it's when transformation actually might just be possible. Mm -hmm. And being able to sense those moments and walk into them and work with them, I think, is a dexterity. The Greeks had it. They had the name for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they actually had the name for it. Yeah. We yeah. just picked up on Kronos, chronological time. That's what we picked up on. Yeah. 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 Thanks for that. And yeah, really um, interesting points. One thing I would just like to... Um, a touch on for a moment about that is um i would suggest that it's not our species that is like this pathologically autopoetic like um but it's it's the way in which our dominant civilization has taken some of the um patriarchal values and done that and i think that's really important because we can be totally proud of being human we don't have to um look at what's going on and say oh with something wrong with our species what we can do is set that intention to take what is really unique about us among other living entities that this kind of conceptual consciousness we have to build technological capabilities and stuff and use that in this process of integration to find a way to we can really be symbiotic with the rest of life on earth and really be part of Gaia so and I, I do think that this is that moment as you referred to Ian we are going through this transformational moment in history in some ways is one of the most exciting times to be alive and is even imaginable and um, both terrifying and exciting <clears throat> but i think what is called on 
basically life is calling on us. Life is calling on us to <clears throat> really expand our identity, to really be all of life, to say, yeah, we're both human um, in us in unique ways and we're part of life. And what we need to do is to change the direction of what has gone, become like this cancerous um, like mistake that the species um, took under capitalism. It's not us as humans. And essentially redefine what it means to be human in, in that symbiose scene. And thank you so much, Jeremy. And that'll make a wonderful concluding comment um, since we've reached the top of the hour here and, and we like to keep these things on time. So I just wanna thank you so much and thank everyone for coming. Um, it has just been an amazing conversation. And um, I know I'm even more excited about your work than ever now and can't wait mm -hmm. to see this next book. Um, and uh, thank you to everybody. And um, thank you to Erica and Ariane behind the scenes and um, hopefully see you all next time. And Jeremy, again, my gratitude for your willingness to share your thoughts with us. Yeah, great. Well, th thank you for the honor of sharing and uh, great conversation. Really, thanks everyone. Um, just love to see all the questions and the thoughts. Yeah. What a great group. This and we will share the, 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 the recording will be shared in a couple of days and the chat. Yeah. So okay. um, thank you to each and all on behalf of the International Management Association, be well. We will certainly get you the recordings and the chat. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.